Please turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians in the New Testament. 2 Corinthians. In a moment, we'll begin studying in uh, chapter 8, verse 1. Chapter 8, verse 1. This sermon this morning is dealing with stewardship. And we want to look into stewardship where one is charged with taking care of what belongs to somebody else according to the will of the person who owns it. We will look at the, as it's called in the scriptures, the grace of Macedonia. Our desire is to set forth and to emphasize how, how the Macedonians gave. And in so doing, we certainly hope to help all of us. Of course, in the light of their example, the Holy Spirit has seen fit for Paul to include in the scriptures that we might be guided in these matters, that we would do a better job in our giving. Now let's go and read these verses in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, please, beginning in verse 1. Paul writes, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. For to their power, I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. Inasmuch that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and all diligence and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. There was a special need in Jerusalem. There were poor among the saints in Jerusalem. We get a picture of this in Romans chapter 15, verses 25 through 27. He's headed toward the end of that epistle to the church in Rome. And he says, But now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. The American Standard says the poor saints among, or the poor among the saints. It has pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. So Paul is mentioning this, and when you see what he had to say in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, and now in the second letter of the Corinthians, and here in Romans, then it's obvious this was a very important matter, and uh, it was one that would serve greatly in making the church be what God wanted it to be in so far as the relationship of Jews and Gentiles, brethren. So Paul was deeply concerned about this need. And he was concerned about supplying, providing the physical things that were needed. He was especially concerned about bringing about a, as I said, a better relationship between Jewish brethren and Gentile brethren. Don't forget how they stood away from one another completely and had nothing to do with one another. And now, of course, they're reconciling Christ by the same gospel they believed and obeyed. And having been added to the church by the Lord himself. Acts 2 and verse 47. 
So this was, that is, his concern about their relationship in Christ, Jew and Gentile, his main concern in regard to this contribution. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 12 through 15, and you'll see, For the administration of this service is not only, or not only supplieth the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God. Whilst by the experiment of this ministration, they glorify God for your professed objection of the gospel of Christ and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men. And by their prayer for you, which long after you for the exceeding grace of God in you, thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. So it was in this connection that Paul labored long and hard to get the Gentile churches such as the churches of Galatia, you see that in 1 Corinthians 16, 1, Macedonia and Achaia, we just read that in Romans 15, 26, to be fully involved in this great contribution. In other words, the money would be great for the folks who were starving, but the motive behind it and what it would do to meld together these brethren in fellowship in Christ would even be a greater thing. The church in Corinth had indicated that it wanted to have a part in this contribution. According to 2 Corinthians 8 and verse number 10, they must have been the very first ones to come forward and say they wanted to be a part of it. Verse 10 reads, And herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you who have begun before not only to do but also to be forward a year ago. But a year had gone by and they had not followed through with the promise they had made. So Paul had instructed them in the first letter toward the end of it in chapter 16. And in the second letter he continues that instruction further. And he does so in a very forceful way. He gives two great and marvelous patterns or examples of giving. The example of the Macedonian brethren to the north in Macedonia from Achaia and Corinth, which is in the south. And the example of Jesus Christ himself to motivate them. Now, if the Holy Spirit had him in this original letter as he writes part of the New Testament to use these two examples to motivate them and to teach them, how much more so for us today shouldn't they have the same impact on you and on me as they had upon the church in Corinth? At this time, let us then study this example of the Macedonians. First of all, there's some preliminary things in understanding this. We want to remember, we want to call to mind that Paul was striving to get the Corinthian brethren notice to do what they could do, but also what they ought to do, and more than that, what they had already promised they would do. Though the church in Corinth did abound in many good things that had not abounded in the matter they had not abounded in the matter of giving. Paul wanted them, as he says, to abound in this grace also, verses six and seven. We want to remember in our study that inspiration calls or labels the giving characteristic of the Macedonians the grace of Macedonia. And we should note that the word grace is variously used in Scripture. Most of the time people think of it only from the standpoint of God's favor that man does deserve and cannot merit in extending forgiveness of sins and sonship and eternal salvation to man. Well, it always has the basic meaning of favor. It always does. But it's in a different context here. And it has nothing to do with God freely giving His gospel, the power of God to save, Romans 1.16, to man. It has to do with people who've already heard, believed, and obeyed it. And they are Christians living out that in their lives. 
I'll remark here and remind you of the sermons a few weeks ago explaining Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, where he concludes that our minds to be renewed and that we are to yield our bodies as living sacrifices to him. That's going to come up in this. In fact, this is a good one to relate to that one, that is, those scriptures. Often, and I'll say again, and generally, it, uh, grace means the love of God as that love relates to man's salvation through Jesus Christ. I will cite again how it's used in Ephesians 2, 5, and 8, speaking of God's motivating factor and His love to give man what man doesn't deserve. And you keep that in mind. As members of the church, that grace should be seen in us, that same favor because the church is the spiritual body of Christ. We were added to that church by the Lord Himself when we from the heart obeyed the gospel of Christ. Romans 6, 17, and 18, Acts 2, verse 38, 47. Now sometimes it simply means favor, as it does in Luke 2, 40, and in the same chapter, verse 52. Sometimes grace refers to thanksgiving, as it does in the earlier part of this second epistle of the Corinthians, chapter 2 and verse 14, as it does in chapter 9 and verse 12 of this same second Corinthian epistle. Sometimes it refers to the contribution. Look in verse 3 of 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and you will see that it so does. We also want to remember that the word grace in 2 Corinthians 8.1 refers to the Macedonian brethren. What they had given. Now watch it. What they had given. Not what God had given them. And it's shown, that is the proof of that is shown in what we shall now notice. It's interesting to look at how the Greek literally would read in this if it were put into English. And here's how it reads. And we make known to you the grace of God. Now, if you're going to just literally render it the Greek. And we make known to you the grace of God, the favor of God. Listen. The having been given in the churches of Macedonia grace. That's how it reads in the Greek. It's that grace. That grace in them giving. That grace in them giving as God has given to us in this matter. I think that's a very beautiful, emphatic, attributive construction. The having been given in the churches of Macedonia grace. Paul thus announces that he's going to talk about the grace of Macedonia. And then he proceeds to discuss how, how I say, that the Macedonians gave. Now, in verse 4, in the King James Version, the uh, King James Version translates the word, which in Greek is charis, translated grace, as gift. Same word that we have in Greek for grace elsewhere, even when it's referring to our salvation that God freely gives us. But here it's translated not grace, but it's translated as a gift. And that has obvious reference then to the monetary gift that Paul was taking up with the various churches uh, and here from the Macedonians in particular for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. And it's obvious that the word charis, grace, in verses 7 and 8 refers to giving. Now, have you ever thought about that? That your contribution pertains to the reflection of the grace of God and extending to us salvation, a salvation we do not deserve, and thus we as members of the church embody that grace as we live the Christian life, and thus what we do with what we have in service to God manifests that favor to everybody else. And in this case, this contribution would, and we've already discussed, uh, discussed how it would. Now the word bounty, which is involved in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 3, refers to the Corinthian contribution. It's also the translation of the Greek word for grace, charis. 
Now let's, with these things in mind, let us then study the grace, the gift, the grace of Macedonia. Now, the grace of Macedonia. How do we see it? How does God present it? What can I get out of this to help me understand better about my life and what I give and what it means? First of all, they gave responsively. They gave responsively. They had been the recipients of God's blessings. They were grateful to have learned the gospel. And they were interested in sharing their material things with others. They knew that what they gave would be used in God's great providence to benefit or help others. So they gave responsibly. But notice they also gave liberally. Liberally. Now, likely, and we learned this from the totality of the information the Bible gives us about the state of affairs financially and economically of the people of Macedonia, they, what they had to give, the Macedonian brethren, it wasn't a very large sum because they didn't have much to give. But what they gave was, watch it, much in comparison to what they had. Paul mentions that these brethren, now watch it, number one, were in the midst of great affliction. Number two, they had an abundance of joy. And number three, they were in deep poverty. And they could give. Paul states that these things work together to produce what of all things? Their liberality. Now, note the elements that produced their great giving in view of what they had. Affliction, joy, poverty. I always thought those things worked to where you couldn't give anything. You know, God sees things so different than we do. And maybe this begins to tell us we've got a little world in us as to how we evaluate what we can do and what we can't. You tell me how many times you would think of going to somebody who was afflicted economically and otherwise, yet they were full of joy, and yet they were poor as a snake, as we used to say at home. You expect anything out of those folks? Paul's telling us here these things work to make them give more than Paul thought they could give. Now notice also that they gave not only liberally but sympathetically. I would say even empathetically. There were poor among the saints down there in Jerusalem. You know, these Macedonian brethren knew what it meant to be poor. They understood it firsthand. The Macedonian brethren were characterized by this empathetic or sympathetic or both understanding. Now listen to me, brethren. Here's a bit of wisdom from God that men don't see it, although they ought to. If you're really ever in need, you will come nearer finding help by going to the person who has been in or is in similar circumstances than the person who's never been there and done that or been involved in it. They understand the hurt personally. Paul says all these things work to cause them to give. Brethren, I tell you today that all these things worked in the carnal mind not a few of which are in the church, to stop us from giving. They gave sacrificiously, strange word, giving up something very important to them and very needful to them that they could really use, but they gave it up for the benefit of somebody else. They were actually worse off materially than were those about whom they were concerned. No one can prove that the church in Jerusalem was poor. If you study the whole thing, you will see that they were poor, as the American Standard translates it, among the saints. But to have poor among the saints doesn't mean all saints are poor. But the churches of Macedonians were poor. It doesn't say they were poor among the saints of Macedonia. It does say that when it comes to Jerusalem, but it just says the churches of Macedonia were poor. They were in poverty. And the Greek carries with the idea they were in deep down poverty. They were bathed in poverty. They were immersed in poverty. 
this was certainly not a case of a church with abundance giving to a church in need. It wasn't at all. In fact, these churches in Macedonia were worse off. And they were giving to churches overall that were better off. The New Testament authorizes, it teaches a religion of going the second mile. In other words, you do what's necessary and then you do more. You don't have to get to Romans and the epistles concerning mostly how to live the Christian life before you learn that. Jesus taught us that. Their giving would be comparable to that of the widow that's discussed by our Lord in Mark 12, 41-44 who had nothing but what was far less, far less than the worth even of a penny now. That's all she had, but she gave it. Wasn't much, but a whole lot, because all she had. And the Lord watched her as he sat over against the treasury, watching those who put in the treasury. We should note that there can be right of action. We might call it liberty of action. Even where there's no specific requirement for action. In other words, you can just give even beyond what you have to give. That's a novel idea, but it seems to be very characteristic of Christianity. These folks not only gave liberally and sympathetically and sacrificially, but they gave spontaneously. Spontaneously. Paul says they were willing of themselves. Now Paul had to write to. He had to plead with. And he had to strongly exhort the Corinthian brethren. Not so in the Macedonians. It takes a heap of teaching to bring about people who will give spontaneously. But I know God delights in spontaneous giving. That is, giving that is the product of one's own free will without any kind of coercion and pressure. Number one, he has nowhere specified that we give a certain amount. Number two, he set forth certain sacred principles which are to guide us in our giving. And number three, he has placed upon us the responsibility of making our own decision about it. And number four, he stressed that our giving shows our love for God. It's proof of it. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 8. These Macedonian brethren also gave appreciatively. Appreciatively. They didn't fuss. They didn't complain. They didn't grumble and grouse. They didn't ask, do we have to have part in this work? Paul says, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. Well, if ever a people might have felt justified in refusing to give of their means to help somebody else, it might have been the Macedonians. Think of what they might have said and been justified in saying it. They might have said, folks, they're better off than we are. And by the way, they are Jews, we're Gentiles, and uh, they don't like us too much. We've had problems with that before. Oh, and here's the good one. We can't respond to every call that comes. I don't know how you reconcile that with be ready into every good work, but it works. We want to spend our money at home so we can see what's going on. But the Macedonian brethren were anxious to do what they could. That'll change things every time. Anxious to do what you can to serve God and just looking for the opportunity and thanking God that it's come our way. In a way, we could, as some have, call this the second, the second Macedonian call. 
Now you remember, not long ago we studied this in the book of Acts, an auditorium class, that the first call is recorded in Acts 16:9, that Paul, as God calls it to happen, in a vision, beheld the man of Macedonia saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. Paul understood that was the Lord's directing him to go preach the gospel over there. So they went into Macedonia, and they preached the gospel in Macedonia, and people in Macedonia believed it and obeyed it, and these churches were established. But now, a call comes from Macedonia again. Well, look at the nature of this call. It comes from the churches of Macedonia themselves. These churches who are bathed in deep down poverty. And what is that call? They don't have much as others did. This is Corinth, according to the history books, a very rich place. And Paul establishes the church being converted out of those people was very well off. But this call that comes from Macedonia for help is come help us. And let us be a part of what you're doing. Pleading with Paul to come get what we have. And to take it to help somebody else. And so they were thus laying up treasure in heaven. Matthew 6, 19. They gave, according to what the divine record indicates, unexpectedly. Paul says, listen to it. And this they did, not as we had hoped. Now remember the word hope means expected. It doesn't mean a wish. It means we didn't expect this from them. This they did not as we hoped, not as we expected. These brethren, in other words, were so poor financially, economically, that Paul didn't expect that they would give very much. But, and this always floors me, they exceeded the great apostle Paul's expectations. That shakes me up every time I read it. Because I know what he gave up. He said he had counted all things but refuse that he might win Christ. He gave it all up. And they surprised him. Now it should be noted that even though Paul did not expect these brethren to give much. Watch it. He did. I say he did expect them to give something. In spite of their deep down poverty. It's just that they gave more than he thought they could. How much did they give? The Bible doesn't say, literally and actually. I say again, as I have several times already, likely it was not a great amount, especially in view of what Corinth could no doubt give. But it was a whole lot in view of what they had to, to give. But it was much then. We ought to think about that, that the Holy Spirit had somebody like this set an example that the Bible says, we poor, downtrodden, misused, and abused Americans could follow to learn how to be like Christ. Brethren, they gave consequentially. Paul says, but they first gave their own selves to the Lord. Now there's the key to a bit of it. I said we'd get back to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, that we're to yield our bodies a living sacrifice unto God, which is our reasonable service. And, and here's where we get back to it. They gave their own selves to the Lord, and then he says, and to us through the will of God. They had given themselves completely, unreservedly, to Jesus Christ. Consequently, they were anxious and glad to have a part in the Lord's work. Now, now note Paul's statement to the Corinthian brethren. For I seek not yours, but you. First, Second Corinthians 12, 14. Somebody get the idea, he just wants money. No. This all has to do with your spirits lining up in the likeness of Christ. For when you're like him, you know, as Paul wrote, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Now, he didn't say there, by the way, it's wrong to receive. He just says it's more blessed to give than to receive. So this is the foundation of all of our giving. Of all our life and of all our work. We must first give ourselves to God unreservedly. And that tells me much about the Corinthians, Romans 12, 1 and 2. That is the Macedonians. 
I can say both of them. Because the example chosen by the Holy Spirit through Paul in this letter to the Corinthians, well, these folks had nothing like the Corinthians. Except evidently they had excelled in their giving themselves to the Lord because that's what he said they first did. So as we conclude, we need to note and remind ourselves that we've looked at the giving characteristic of the churches of Macedonia. We need to be reminded this is chosen by the Holy Spirit as an example for you and for me to evaluate ourselves. Honestly, objectively, and in the light of the truth, especially this truth, from these poor brethren of long ago who gave more than Paul thought they could give, surprised him, and begged him to take what we have. We have noted that they gave responsibly, liberally, sympathetically, sacrificially, spontaneously, appreciatively, unexpectedly, and consequentially. Now listen to me, brethren. They were challenged to do this giving. If you will ever grow in the area of your contribution in everything, it will be when you're willing to say, I can give a little more. But now if you're going to measure yourself on the basis of poor folks in the church, then that's going to backfire in your face. Because the very ingredients that help these poor brethren in Macedonia to give were the things that most of us use to justify ourselves in not giving. Well, whatever you have materially, much or little, the day that the end comes and the elements melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works to therein are burned up. It's all going then, but too late to help other people. Let's remember that inspiration set forth these details. Number one, to encourage the Corinthian brethren to give as they ought to. And number two, to encourage us to give as we ought. Now I want to say one thing in closing on this. People too often, and they'll know better, say, well, I'm giving to the church. Does it surprise you if I tell you I've never given to the church? In fact, I've never given anything to the church except in a roundabout way. Do you notice that he didn't say they had given them holy, themselves wholly and completely to the church? He said they had given themselves wholly and completely to the Lord. If your mind, when you give whatever you give, your talents or your time or your money, if in your mind you think, well, I'm giving to the church, you better realize you're giving to the Lord. That's who I give to. How about you? When I sing songs of praise, it's to the Lord. When I even sing those songs that admonish and teach one another, it's still because the Lord wants me to do it. And I preach the gospel because the Lord wants me to do it. Does it involve people? Of course it does. That's a silly question to even entertain or ask. But what we do is to the Lord. Paul makes that clear when he says, our body is our giving is a living sacrifice to the Lord. And the Macedonians first gave themselves to the Lord. And that's the reason they're deep down bathed in poverty state of affairs. They wanted to give something to the Lord. It'll make a difference. Oh, I give to his work. Well, that's the Lord. But it helps the church, yes. That's the, and the elders control it. But all of that is set out in the last will and testament of Christ. That's all according to the Lord. I give to the Lord. I give my praise and my service and my preaching and my life and all that I have to the Lord and thus he who has all authority governs what I do and what I give and whatsoever you do, in word or in deed. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Colossians 3.17
So learn from this powerful message the Holy Spirit's put in the Bible to teach us about giving. And look at the Macedonians and look at their giving and their motivation and how they gave. And then honestly ask yourself the question in view of what you have. You think you got that by yourself? Or did God bless you with it? Well, I hope you say, as I put myself into it, according to his will, he blessed me with it. But I'd like to think that that was the same Macedonians. When Paul went over and preached the truth to them, now they respond. Because they'd first given themselves to the Lord. If you're subject to the gospel indication, know that the terms of the gospel are set out clearly in the New Testament regarding salvation. You must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized by the authority of Christ into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of your sins. As a child of God, if you've committed public sins, we offer this invitation to you too to come before the church and make confession of the sins that you've committed. And we'll pray with you and for you as the New Testament instructs us that you will know once again the forgiveness of sins and reconciliation to God. We offer the invitation of the Lord to you. Now will you respond to the Lord in obedience to his gospel while we stand and sing.